Hello and welcome again to this episode of Dogs with Torches. In this episode, we are joined together again with Dr. Dominic DeTore to discuss the medieval debates centered around analogy and demonstration. In particular, we discuss the writings of the great cardinal and theologian Thomas de Vio Cajetan and his significant contributions to the debates on analogy and demonstration. So now turning uh, away from uh, Flandrensis and Sonsinus, uh, we're, we're now going to turn to uh, Thomas uh, de Vio Cajetan uh, and, and his sort of uh, his answer to, um, uh, to, to, to the, the uh, the analogy, uh, the problems with analogy. Uh, if, you, if you give a brief uh, introduction to uh, Cajetan, who is he? Why is he important to uh, philosophy and and, and then the school of uh, of Thomism in general? Um, what what are his, his, his sort of significant contributions? Okay. Well, as I've said already, Cajetan is a uh, participant in that Bologna uh, Thomist school. An inheritor, the thought of Natalis, Caprilus, Flandrensis, and uh, Sonsinus. There are other major figures that are also operative uh, over there, you know, such as uh, Silvestro Prierius. And there are other figures that come out of that school that are very much influenced uh, by uh, Cajetan himself, a, uh, such as uh, uh, Chrysostom Iavelli. Uh, Cajetan becomes a master general of the Dominican order which uh, gives other Dominicans all the more reason to be reading his work. Mm. And uh, it comes to pass then that Cajetan's understanding of Aquinas and Cajetan's uh, extensive writings become very widely read uh, among the Dominicans and then subsequently very widely read among the Jesuits and anybody else who wants to be in one way or another a participant in the uh, Thomist tradition. Mm. Uh, so much so that when you get into the end of the 19th century and they're preparing critical editions uh, at the call of, uh, of uh, Pope Leo XIII of the mm. writings of, Aqu of Aquinas, you get Cajetan's commentary on Aquinas's Summa Theologiae included with okay. Aquinas's Summa Theologiae. And so no, no. The, the understanding being, well, we want to read this, but we want to read it with good, uh, solid... Uh, commentary. Well, we've got this great solid commentary, uh, and so we will publish it uh, uh, right along with the other texts. Gotcha. So, very significant figure in that, right? In his own day, he was one of the people that got sent to argue with Luther. Mm, and right. He wrote uh, uh, commentaries on scripture to go along with his uh, commentaries on the works of Aquinas. His Writings on these particular questions stem from very early in his career, so even before 1500. He initially just talks about analogy in his commentary on Aquinas's On Being and Essence. And then he wrote a follow up text to that uh, called On Analogy of Names. Mm. All right. Well, if we can uh, jump right into that, what is Cajetan's uh, 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 analogy of names? Or, uh, did they denominum analogia and, and what are sort of um Cajetan's aims uh in in this treatise is, is he primarily concerned with the sort of semantic questions of of analogy well he's primarily concerned with sorting out inter Thomas debates and addressing what he thinks are the most pressing objections uh from John Dunn Scotus mm -hmm. and the Scotist school of thought you could say that he's interested in answering the Scotus professor across the hallway, right? As uh, he's the Cajetan's uh, the chair of Thomistic metaphysics, in uh, contrast to the guy across the street who's the chair of Scotist metaphysics, hmm. at uh, over there in Bologna. Interesting. All right. Um, if, if if I can ask then, um, with respect to Cajetan, how does he um, answer the? Uh, the ratio rationis problem in uh, analogy. D does he hold to, to one concept or a multiplicity of concepts? As, uh, from what I understand from my reading, he sort of radically breaks from, well, not radically, but, but he, he sort of breaks from Flandrensis and Sonsinus on insisting of, of a multiplicity of, of rationis instead of uh, in, instead of one uh, 
Razio. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say that his position is, uh, well, it's a mixture of all of the positions. So if we're going to let uh, Kajitan uh, speak in his own name to a certain degree. Hmm. In his work on being in essence, he emphasizes that analogy is a middle between equivocation and uh, univocity. And so it shares in a way in the properties of both. And he says, and that is why some philosophers have said that there is just one ratio in analogy and other philosophers have said that there are two rationes in analogy. And it'll maintain in a certain way, there's one in a certain way, there is two. So if we're going to go with a, say, non-theological example to, uh, to think about the point. So if we think about, say, uh, go back to the example of saying the ditch is deep and uh, saying that uh, Darth Vader's voice is deep. Mm. Okay. Now, I can form a concept of, the, of deep as it applies to a voice, and I can form a concept of deep as it applies to a ditch. And these are two different concepts. Uh, even though ditch is, excuse me, deep is said by analogy of the voice and of the ditch. Uh, so that's a way in which it's similar to equivocation. Mm. But he maintains, insofar as they are similar to each other by analogy of proportionality, insofar as they have analogous or proportional unity, Okay, the depth of the ditch and the depth of the voice, the formal concept that properly or distinctly signifies one of them also, and at the same time, improperly signifies the other just insofar as they are proportionally similar. Hmm. So my concept of deep as it signifies James Earl Jones's voice At the same time, as it's signifying you know, that proper sense of depth that applies to it, right. signifies the depth of a ditch insofar as the depth of a ditch is proportionally similar okay. to the depth of a voice. So his answer then is, is, to, is to claim that, that there, there's a multiplicity of concepts, mm -hmm. but one concept can be used to... Uh, to understand something perfectly and another uh, uh, thing sort of imperfectly. And this is through proportionality. That's right. Okay, so he's breaking with Sonsina saying, well, it's a separate concept okay. that we're using or some kind of super concept that we're using. And he's saying, really, it is the concept of one of the analogates that we're using. But the concept that is the distinct concept of one of the analogates is also able to be a representation of what it is analogous to with the proviso precisely in so far as they have this proportional unity. Okay. So then speaking about uh, syllogistic demonstrations and how, how, how that relates to God and, and, and creatures, would, would Cajetan hold that, that we have a concept of the being of creatures that we can imperfectly apply to the divine, to, to, to God? Is, is that what he would say? Uh, yeah, that say your concept of creaturely being or substantial being, whichever concept it is that you're using here, insofar as there is a proportionality between divine being and uh, creaturely being, mm. your concept of creaturely being signifies divine being you know, with that proportionality. Okay. So, so effectively that there is something about God that is proportionally similar to okay. uh, creaturely being, or and, to and use a standard example of wisdom. Well, I know what uh, wisdom is. I conceive of wisdom as it applies to uh, my professors of uh, philosophy. Sure. And uh, I say, well, when I say that God is wise, I'm saying that there is some way in which my professor's wisdom is proportionally similar to something in God. Okay. And so, so proportionality has to be a necessary condition for employing concepts perfectly and, and, and imperfectly. Like, like if, if there isn't proportionality, you just can't make that move, right? That's right. There wouldn't be any unity. So if you go back to the, those different modes of unity that Aristotle talked about. Now you've got your numerical unity, your specific unity, your generic unity, and your analogous unity. 
there's got to be some kind of unity that we're signifying with our concepts. Otherwise, we can't go from what well, we know about one thing to uh, to learn something about something else. Uh, if there's not uh, some kind of unity between what it is that is true about uh, my wife's dog, I can't use what I know about my wife's dog to draw an inference about about your dog. Right. And in that case, there's specific unity. So I could actually know quite a bit about your dog by know what it is I know about uh, dogness as it as I discover it from my wife's dog. Mm -hmm. uh, but since there's at least proportional unity between divine being and uh, creaturely being, I can know something about divine being from my experience of creaturely being. Now, granted, it's going to be a lot less <laughs> than what I can know about things where that have uh, generic or specific unity. Sure. Because well, yeah, non-generic proportional unity <laughs> Or I say less than generic unity that is the less than generic unity that is proportional unity while still a mode of unity it's you know, it's less than generic sure so sure it's uh i mean that really makes a difference just like having generic unity makes a difference on what you can know about something from where you had specific unity sure interesting all right then so so it seems then that that Cajetan's really opting for the principal proportionality uh, model of, of analogy. Yep. Does he, in any, any place, mm -hmm. uh, sort of wrestle with or talk about the healthy model, or does he just, is there any point, point where he explicitly rejects it, or is, it, is he just completely focused on uh, proportionality? So in the opening few chapters of, uh, on uh, analogy of names, he follows the example of Caprilus, and goes to that text from Aquinas' uh, commentary on the sentences where Aquinas gives a threefold division of analogy. The one that we haven't mentioned is analogy of inequality. Mm. And I don't want to confuse the issue with, with you today by getting into an analogy of inequality, um, looking at the time that, that, uh, that we have. And then he maps on healthy model of analogy and principal model of analogy to those other two divisions from that uh, threefold division that you find in uh, Aquinas's on the commentary on the sentences. And he gives an account in those opening chapters of those different modes of analogy and gives the argument that for the point of view of actually doing metaphysical demonstration or natural theology demonstrations, uh, what it is that you need is this analogy of proportionality or what we're calling principal model analogy to pull off the demonstrations. And you see him really getting into why that is going to be the case as you go through the subsequent chapters of the text uh, and where he will discuss uh, issues like abstraction, how that applies to analogy. And in that uh, second to last chapter, where he addresses specifically analogy and demonstration, okay. where you can really see the payoff as he's responding to SCOTUS that, well, applying right, this understanding of proportional unity will enable me to preserve valid syllogisms hmm. in a way that I couldn't if I relied upon the uh, healthy model of analogy where there isn't even proportional unity sure. between the analogous. Sure. Interesting. So would it be fair to say that Cajetan's, when he's drawing on Aquinas, he's really relying on the sort of early uh, threefold division that Aquinas employs in his sentence commentaries. He's relying on his early works to sort of read the rest of, of Aquinas. Would you say that that's fair? Or? I wouldn't go in, in that direction. I would say that what Cajetan is doing is he's following the example of his uh, Bologna school uh, Dominican tradition. Okay. okay. They built off of uh, Caprilus. Caprilus cited that text, sure. Aquinas, and then worked from that threefold division. Sonsinus did exactly the same thing. And uh, so Cajetan has to address that threefold division because that's, uh, that's what you do if you're a contemporary <laughs> of, uh, of Cajetan's. Okay. At, at, at that school, that's the text that you work from. And then what does he do? He integrates that text with later texts. Okay. Not only the uh, 
the De Veritate text, which he very explicitly is uniting. But then the other texts uh, where Aquinas is is discussing analogy. And uh, when then what you see Aquinas, uh, Skagitan doing is really favoring the principal model of analogy because he sees the philosophical payoff of it. Sure. So he's less interested in those texts, such as the analogy of names, in giving you a kind of chronology of the thought of Aquinas and trying to see whether or not there's a developmental mental model happening or trying to see whether or not he can sort out all the texts to make them consistent and more interested in what is it that Aquinas has to say that's of insight to save metaphysics, sure. to save, save uh, natural theology, or should we all just become scotists? Sure. <laughs> gotcha. All right, then. So looks like we have kind of kind of a good, good grasp of, of Cajetan's understanding of the ratio, rationis problem, and the model problem. With respect to syllogistic uh, demonstration, how would, um, uh, w w w how does Cajetan's answer uh, sort of avoid uh, equivocation? Like if we're using wisdom as the minor term uh, in a syllogism, mm -hmm. would Cajetan say that, you know, that term wisdom, it doesn't stand for, for one concept of wisdom. It's, it's a multiplicity of concepts that are proportionally identical. Is, is, is that correct? Or? Sure. So if you're thinking of a, uh, like Kajitan's example, yep. uh, major premise, all simple perfections are present in God. Wisdom, minor premise, wisdom is a simple perfection conclusion. Wisdom is in God. So the analysis that Kajitan can give to you there is that wisdom in that minor premise, but we know about wisdom that, that wisdom from our experience of creatures. Mm. So first and foremost, our formal concept of wisdom in that minor premise is representing the quality that is wisdom. I see. But the quality that is wisdom is proportionally similar to divine wisdom. Okay. And so insofar as our formal concept signifies the quality of wisdom, it also signifies divine wisdom in as much as divine wisdom is proportionally similar to creaturely wisdom. For being more precise, we'd put that relationship the other way around. I would say in as much as creaturely wisdom is proportionally similar to divine wisdom. Okay. So then the conclusion, wisdom is, in, is present in God, mm. is effectively saying that... Uh, there is something in God proportionally similar to what is in the creatures, or put it the other way around. This creaturely wisdom is something proportionally similar to it. I see. In God. Fascinating. All right. Well, I think that that, that covers, I mean, all, all the uh, the thinkers I want to discuss. I, I know in your book that you you cover thinkers after uh, Kajitin, but, but sort of for, for the sake of time, I... I, 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 I figured we, we might save that for, for, for another day, but um, which of the, the Thomists that we've looked at so far, uh, which of the Thomists we've looked at most closely resembles Aquinas' own theory, in, in, in your opinion? I mean, is this, would you say that the one thinker is closer to, to Aquinas in, 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 a, in a certain respect? Or? Well, I would say that Dominica Flanders is very careful to stick to Aquinas' this position. You're not going to find uh, Dominica Flanders, at least I haven't found Dominica Flanders saying anything other than what Aquinas says mm. uh, on, uh, on these issues. Mm. But uh, Dominica Flanders also has one of the least integrated sure. uh, accounts. So... It has the virtue of being close to Aquinas, but the virtue of being close to Aquinas there is also the problem with Aquinas. Sure. That Aquinas doesn't actually offer you an integrated uh, way of dealing with these, uh, with these set of problems. Sure. Well, and then I guess my next question would be, uh, which would you think of, of the thinkers we've discussed uh, provides the most coherent and, and convincing answer to the, uh, the problems in, uh, in analogy? Well, at the moment... I'm spending most of my time with Kajitan. Okay. I'm, I'm actually working on writing a, uh, an introduction 
to uh, uh, Kajitan's uh, on being in essence. Nice. So I'm spending even more time with Kajitan than I than I used to. So perhaps it's just due to extra familiarity with Kajitan. I'm finding his uh, his position all the more engaging and uh, alluring, and seeing more thoroughly how it interacts with or absorbs the insights of the positions that uh, that come before him. But I have to admit, when I'm reads Francis Sylvester Ferrara, <laughs> well, we didn't get to, right. uh, but he's coming after uh, a Kajitan. I have a similar experience uh, reading Fra Francis Sylvester of, uh, of Ferrara. Okay. So uh, I guess you could say at the moment, I'm leaning towards, uh, towards Kajitan, but who knows, maybe when I get to spend some more time with some of these other figures, I will uh, uh, see the virtue of their positions in uh, greater light. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. In, 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 in your great book, I mean, there's, you, you discuss figures after, uh, that come after Cajetan. And it's also important to point out that, that it's not just Thomists or, or Dominican theologians that are interested in these questions of analogy. There, there are, uh, Scotistic, you know, thinkers who, you know, try, try to provide an account of, you know, the, the, the diversity of, of things and, and, and their, and their, uh, this is sort of metaphysical uh, similarity to one another and how that relates to uh, university. And there's also Jesuit uh, thinkers who take on the, the questions of analogy. I mean, it's not just limited to Dominican uh, thinkers. Oh, and it's uh, not limited to scholastic thinkers. Right. Yeah. Uh, if you're interested in uh, uh, continuing on, with this particular project in the context of the analytic philosophy, you could uh, look up uh, Chris McDaniel's book. I'm trying to remember now what the name of Chris McDaniel's uh, uh, book is, uh, but he discusses there the notion of ways of being. And he takes up the, the dispute over effectively university of being versus analogy of being in uh, 20th century philosophy with a main, major focus on analytic philosophy, but with uh, some engagement in existentialist philosophy, and he even draws in some scholastic thinkers to enrich his thought. When I read that book, what I see just is a recapitulation of the scholastic debate, just engaged in by analytic and existentialist philosophers in the 20th century. Nice. Well, then I guess for uh, a sort of closing uh, question, do you have any reading recommendations for uh, folks who, who want to study more on, on this subject? I mean, I, I, I think that your, your, your book, uh, An Analogy After Aquinas, is, 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 it, it's, a, it's a hard read, but I think that, that, that you give an, an exposition of all these thinkers you know, very well. And I know that, that, that another, uh, uh, an, an, an another author that, that that's very much helped me is uh, uh, E. Jennifer Ashworth's uh, uh, writings on on the medieval debates on on analogy and sort of the the uh, tra tra trajectory of where they they go. Well, anything by uh, Ashworth is gold. Uh, so definitely, the writings of Ashworth are excellent. So, if you know French, her uh, uh, les théories de analogie, I'm going to butcher the French. I, I was supposed to learn French, and all I learned was how to mispronounce. Uh, <laughs> uh, French uh, French words. I can read the uh, stuff on analogy in French, but uh, trying to speak it is uh, an exercise in butchery. Uh, so that's a, that's one book of hers that goes through her overall understanding and presentation of analogy, at least up to the time that it was published, and that was around 2006, uh, I believe. But most of her work is in English. Uh, the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article, Medieval Theories of Analogy, a uh, good source to go to. I recently took on that page, so I've become the secondary author uh, on that. Uh, updated the bibliography, updated the section on Kajitan, but uh, the majority of that are, that is still uh, Ashworth's uh, original presentation there. Gotcha. Uh, other things to recommend to you, uh, certainly uh, Joshua Hochschild's book, The Semantics of Analogy, that uh, inspired my dissertation and my work on uh, figures uh, before Kajitan and then subsequent uh, to Kajitan. So those would be good places to start. Anything by Ashworth, 
uh, Hawk Shields, the semantics of analogy and for a broad overview, the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry, Medieval Theories of Analogy. Wonderful. Are, do you have any more closing remarks? I, I think we, we, we've covered pretty much everything I've, I've wanted to cover, and I think we're still good for, for, for time. I think so. Well, thank you very much, Hunter. I appreciate uh, getting to talk to you. This uh, generates some uh, follow-up questions, and mm. uh, no, that would be nice to get into some of the follow-up questions and perhaps get into some more detail. Absolutely. Maybe uh, go through an argument, uh, a particular argument in detail. Absolutely. Dr. Dottori, thank you so much for joining with us. Yeah, thank you very much, Hunter. Take care.